Janet started teaching tennis to others at the age of 15. It began when her coach, Tom Stowe, had Janet help with a summer camp for young kids at the Berkeley Tennis Club. That fall, she started an early tennis clinic at her high school because they had two courts that no one used at all. The school had rackets, but Janet had to go find some tennis balls. <laughs> Those were those hard to get back then? Or they, uh, they didn't have big five sporting goods. <laughs> um, after Janet's international playing career uh, came to a halt, she was married and started her family. Janet continued giving clinics, but as she was still an amateur, could only get paid the amount of the USTA allowed at the time, which was guess when it would guess how much a day she was allowed to make. Ten dollars. <laughs> a little bit better than that. It was, uh, it was $43 a day, but yeah, but I'm sure she could have made way more if she wanted to. Uh, when open tennis was declared in 1968, that's when Janet decided to turn pro. She, but then later she applied to the USPTA as Janet knew Tex Schwab, who was the current president at the time. Don Leary, the tennis pro here at STC, had started a division, and that's when Janet got involved. In 1970, Janet formed her own tennis camp business, J-A-T-A. Jada. 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 Good to know. Jada. And Janet Atkinson's tennis adventures continued many more years, and she taught for many more years after that, and still to this day is spreading tennis to everybody. She's here today, and that's what we're celebrating. So I want to tell you a little bit about the award, and the Hall of Fame Award and Committee. The committee was founded by us USPTA pros because through the years we've seen a lot of pros who have uh, done amazing things, but you know, as a tennis pro, you only have so many years before your body says, I gotta get off the court, right? We're involved in the other ways, but uh, there's a lot of pros that have done amazing things, and Janet is obviously one of them, and she is gonna be the only the second person to be put into the whole thing. And it's hard because you know, we have to find good nominations and vote on them and talk about them. And uh, we don't get that many submissions. But I want to tell you the story. When we went through our submissions this year, we had three. And uh, we went through a couple of them was good. But when Janet's name came up and we graded her, uh, every category was like a five. And this is the highest number. And we just said, this is the easiest decision we've ever made. And so, uh, congratulations on making our lives easy, and thank you very much for that. Um, so next up, we are going to hear some testimonials, all right? And uh, Marcelo, who is one of Jan's students, is going to speak a little bit on her behalf. So please come up, Marcelo. Thank you. Okay. I was trying to think, what could I say about Janet that I remembered about her? So I came up with several different words. And one was talkative. <laughs> Janet, you can walk into a room and she's very inclusive. She, you go up and she starts talking and to hear her tell her stories are incredible and fun. And it's just amazing what she came up against as a woman in tennis. And so that was encouraging for me and I, I know for many other women of what you went through and the tenacity that you had to uh, have your career. And so that means a, means a lot in that respect. And another one is a mentor. I don't remember, Janet, when I met you and how I met you. Uh, but I remember some, some things that uh, I did with you and one was to go to the JATA um, camp and it was awesome and just a great time and her her knowledge and the way that she explained it and just really felt like you were the pro there yourself and so it was really really encouraging and, and memorable for me and it just gave me a lot of inspiration and courage to go out and do uh, what I'm doing today and so as a venture and she was to the place where call me anytime if you need something or you, you need some help feel free to call me and so I so the word juggle came to my mind. She was doing her camps, she was coaching, teaching, and she had seven children. 
I only have three. Mm -hmm. And I, to juggle three kids and still have a career and do what you have in passion. So she inspired me in that way that the endless energy that she had and the passion that she had for her family and for tennis and was able to do both. And that was, that was inspiring also in that respect. And then I think that's, those are the words I have when I think of Janet uh, in that respect. And just really respect her as a person. Remember coming to her home. I been up at Cherry Quest. I taught tennis for Bellevue uh, Parks years, and they had two courts at the Cherry Crest. And I drive up into the school, and I look at her. Oh, who has a personal tennis court? <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I want to know who that is. So, and so, I, for a couple couple years or maybe a year, I got the Genta information about tennis camp and about helping with the USPTA testing, and she said, come on up to my house and we'll get started. i got a group of people that I want to work with. That's great. And so I drive up to her house and I get up there and I go, oh, she's the one. <laughs> <laughs> she had her own tennis court and that was, that was an awesome time too. So Jen and I really appreciate you as a person, as a professional, and as a mother, and like, uh, watching you live your life through through them. And I know you're one of your brothers, which is, if anything, was the rest of your family, very open, giving hearts, and supportive of, of the tennis uh, community. So thank you, and congratulations for being inducted. All right, so one of uh, the three people we're going to speak today, testimonials, is from the person that nominated Janet, but unfortunately, yeah, Tracy Schroeder, who was the nominating person, is not here with us, but she was nice enough to send me a video. So I've got this really big screen that you guys can see. <laughs> um, I'm going to hold up to the mic, so hopefully you guys can hear, um, but we will also post this video on our Facebook page so you guys can watch it later and all this other stuff. So hopefully this works. I'm gonna do the shot page. Um here she goes. Hi Janet, I'm truly devastated that I cannot be there to attend your ceremony today as I just flew into Dubai yesterday. However I'm hoping by submitting this video that I can show you my appreciation as my coach, as as the wonderful person that you are and my mentor. It's a little fitting that I'm here actually because after my WTA career ended, I took a very long time off and didn't really develop as a full-rounded coach until I came here uh, and started coaching again full-time uh, about 10 years ago. This place is actually where I spent the most time with you. Being able to hear your voice when I'm speaking to my players and analyzing in the practical ways in which you taught me. It's crazy to think that wherever your players go, show you just how far reaching your words are echoing. In a way, I've become some extension of your coaching that's reaching players from South Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Those kids will go back to their respective countries and echo the words that you said to me 30 years ago, perhaps another 30 years from now. That's certainly how relevant I see your coaching style in the world today. Janet, you were never a coach to just put in your time. You were patient, you are passionate, you've resonated with so many, and you're truly an extension of my family, and what an impact that you have made on me. Wherever in the world I may be, you are as much part of my life today as all those hours that we spent on the court together when I was 12. To this day, I can call you for you to help me, to mentor me, to become a better coach. You are so deserving of this award and so inspirational, and I wish I was there to share it, with you and to give it to you. I love you dearly and I can't wait to see you when I get back. Spreading it all over the world. That's awesome. Yeah. Sorry that wasn't bigger but it was sent to me this morning so I didn't have a chance. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay so now we have a uh, special presentation from Seattle Tennis Club. <laughs> Before the special presentation, I thought I'd put a few words. I was only 16 years old, and I knew that I, my game, I needed more help on my game in order to improve. 
And so my dad went and played squash with Bill Atkinson. Bill was a great squash player, great squash player. And um, he said, well, Bill, Trish needs some help with her game. And Bill said, well, have her call Janet. So that, and I heard it. I knew Janet Atkinson's name. I knew her name. She had been where I wanted to go. And so the next day I called her. I said, Janet, Janet, will you hit with me? And she said, of course, I'll hit with you. And that started a whole years of coaching from Janet, all for free. And Janet, amazing, she had the court in the back of her house, remember? And at that time, I think she had five kids. So the lesson was not only on how to get your slice back and how to come in, how to get the chop volleys, but it was a great lesson on mental focus because you had all of these distractions. Kids <laughs> running around. And she would say, concentrate, trip, concentrate. So amazing coaching. So when I thought about this, um, when you think about it, there are only about, you could count on your fingers how many people have made it to the international circuit from the Pacific Northwest, because it rains all the time. But Janet not only made it to the Pacific Northwest, uh, to the international circuit, but she also coached somebody who made it there. So Janet, unbelievable what you've done for so many people, myself, and for so many people. We all thank you, and you are highly deserving of this honor. But there's another honor, Jan honor, Janet, that we want to give you. So please step on up. It's another honor we give you. Face the crowd. <laughs> and there's another board member back here, Joe Hunt. On behalf of the president of the tennis club, Carrie Loveman, Christian Thon, the general manager, Alice Foreman, who's the head of all the committees here, and all the boards, we want to give you an honorary membership oh, to the tennis club. So welcome back. <laughs> great time to have you speak right. and present you with this award on behalf of the Hall of Fame for USPT. Congratulations and thank you very much for all your service. <laughs> it's heavy, right? Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Well, uh -oh. Yeah. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I've got the volume control here. <laughs> well, I first want to thank Chad and Marcio and Dan because uh, Don Patch because um, I did. Uh, of course, Tracy. Tracy is the one that nominated me, and then I was very fortunate in finding Jody Rush, and Jody and Tracy both wrote letters for me, which I really was very appreciative of. Um, Still kind of amazed at the tennis club thing. <laughs> Something that I've wanted for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Because this is kind of was my home here, as everybody knows. Uh, I really appreciate um, all the kind words, and I, I think, yes, I have so many stories. Um, and to share, when you mentioned, and I think. I think Tracy said, and I think Marcel said, about sharing, you know, my passion for the game. And so I have to relate this story because it's just kind of crazy, but I think it, it tells you about that passion, but also about what I think any professional person, in particular a tennis person, would always do. So last year, my oldest grandson was graduating from Regis College in Denver. It was May. It was an outside graduation, and it snowed on us. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all freezing. We were all freezing, and during the ceremony, I noticed a few people had coffee. And so I, moment, I said, I go, you know, I'm going to go get some coffee. So I had to walk around through the crowds and get to the studio. And so I'm in line for coffee. And there's a big, tall fellow in front of me at the coffee. 
and he's complaining about the cold and everything, and he says, oh, it's really hurting my knee, and, and I said, oh, you have a bad knee? He says, yeah, I have a knee replacement. And so I said to him, yeah, I have two. <laughs> and so I said, oh, really? And he says, oh, God, he said, uh, um, he said, well, I play baseball for Regis. He's out as shortstop. And, uh, and he said, my knee, you know, I've had to have it replaced. He was a pretty young, young man, I would say maybe 35 or so. And so we got talking, and he asked me about my knees, and I said, well, tennis. And I played a lot of tennis, and he said, oh. And, and I said, yeah, and, and teaching put a lot of stress on me. He says, oh. He says, you know, I've taken up tennis. And he said, I really like it, but I can't serve it. He said, I have the worst time serving. This is all in the coffee room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he says, you know, I was a shortstop, and I sidearmed all the time. So he said, I was having a lot of trouble, you know, with my serve. And I said, oh, no, that's really easy. I said, you know, it's like passing a football. You just have to rear back and let it go up higher. And he's, and he's standing in this line, and he's going, right! I said, my God, that's so easy. Here, let me buy you my, your coffee. <laughs> so I'm thinking, here I am in the middle of Denver giving a tennis lesson in the coffee line. But that's kind of what I think throwing is all about. I think that that's, that's you know, it kind of comes out where you don't even least expect it. And I think I was very lucky uh, to have found this game. I mean, my family knows, but some of you people probably don't know that I was a tomboy and I played everything with the boys. And it just so happened that I had a, 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 just a little girl on the block with me. I was, I was just going to be 12. And she belonged to a little tennis club. This was in Sacramento. It was right after the war and things were just trying to get going again. And she said, if you have a dollar, we're having a clinic. And it, in the morning, Saturday morning, and I went home and I asked my mother if I could have a dollar to go to this clinic. And the only racket was my sister's. <laughs> a little Narragansett light racket. And, and my mother said, she, yes. And I think my mother was thinking this would maybe be something good. My mother and father actually had played tennis. So I went, and the first day, and I never forgot this in all of my teaching, the first day the woman said to me, okay, here's the tennis court, and you have to keep the ball within the lines, one bounce is allowed here, you can hit it in the air, but she just told me a little bit about the game, keep it in here, that you don't need the alleys if you're playing by yourself, but if there's two of you, she just explained that, and she told me how to score. And that was it. That was it. This is the clinic. <laughs> and you know what? I picked up that racket that day, and probably just from all of the athletic skills I had, I could probably beat everybody there that day. The end of the clinic, she took us over to a backboard. Is there still a backboard here? Yes. Yeah. 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 Wait for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's not my speed now. Uh, and she took us to the backboard and she showed us. Well, see, I had been pitching old baseball games against our garage for years. So I immediately took to that backboard and I crawled over the fence that night and came back to the tennis club and started playing games on that backboard. And within the, you know, within not even a year, I won my first tournament and was on my way. So I mean, it's just kind of an amazing story. But I've never forgotten that woman. Her name was Mrs. Sirocco. And I always felt that that was the way to approach people in teaching, is not screw them up with a whole lot of things about, you better hold the racket this way, or you better do this, you know, this way. She let me do, just let me go. And then it was through people, then gradually helping me do things there in Sacramento, and then me playing a few junior tournaments and all of a sudden finding, you know, that I could win and, and I was good. And then my father being transferred to the Bay Area and being given a membership at the Berkeley Tennis Club, who the coach, Don Budge, Tom Stowe was there, and he tapped me on the shoulder about three months I was there and he tapped me on the shoulder and said, come on, I'm going to show you how to play this game. 
and I was very, very fortunate because he he had the strategy and the tactics that nobody, you know, that I didn't know, and that the people that had just hit with me didn't really know. So it was from him that I got an awful lot of my ability to see, and then he was the one that let me teach at that, at that little clinic. So it was really uh, the beginning of something that I think uh, has always been with me. When I married Bill Agassiz, I remember him saying, I know how much you love tennis, and he said, I will never want you to take that away. I will never take that away from you. And so I think that helped absolutely when Marcio mentions about the kids at all, that, that I always had the tennis. And I still have the tennis. So thank you all so much for coming. And I hope that this continues with some other people to come up and get this award. I, I really hope. And particularly, um, I noticed that the, I don't know how much with, with your group when you meet, um, that you emphasize the master professional side. Because uh, that's very important of being able, I was extremely lucky to come in to tennis when the boom occurred in the 70s. And because I wasn't a pro at a club, I was able to take advantage of all of the things that came up. I mean, probably some of you remember the Nordstrom Hotel thing, and I even played in that, and got to go back east in that. Um, that promotion for Nordstrom, I did uh, for Olympic Steam Company. I went to the National Architects Convention for about four years during that time and put on a tennis day for it. You know, that's what they wanted to do to be known. Uh, all of those promotions, I mean, do you remember Pete Gross? I did tennis tips with Pete Gross on the radio at the time. Uh, there were so many, yeah, there were so many opportunities that I just seemed to be the one that was around that I got to do all of them. But it certainly, how about the Daisy Doubles? Does anybody remember the Daisy Doubles? that we put on for the Child Hearing League, and all of the clubs cooperated to be able to do that. And that was a few people here with me at the tennis club, and we just kind of invented that for the Child Hearing League, you know, for fundraising. And I ended up doing one in Portland, because they saw how successful it was here, and we did the busy doubles in Portland. So, you know, I mean, to spread tennis has been pretty much my life. And that uh, is just goes to show the opportunities when somebody has an opportunity to spread things. That that's, you know, I think it's just natural. So, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, Chad, for all the work you've done to put this together. Director, and I said, Hi, my name's Tom Patch, and the executive director. 
what qualifies you for this job? <laughs> <laughs> you have time. You have time. <laughs> No, that was a gift. It was a gift. And you know that when I was in the late 70s, I was the first woman president of the group. And I remember going to the National Convention in Las Vegas and walking into the room and it was all men. I was the only woman in there. Walked in and all these guys were looking at me like, are you in the wrong place? <laughs> No, I'm in the It's different now. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine what I'm like. I have one thing I remember. Uh, uh, that I was a Black Holmes fan. Oh! I was a big Black Holmes fan. And specifically when I saw him in the U.S. Open Cup, I was like, you know, that, that story you wrote about the Italian Open I never wanted to go anywhere so bad after after reading your article. It was kind of like that deal place to watch it. But it kind of ended abruptly. I was wondering what happened. Editing. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I write it, they cut it. <laughs> but he was a, a wonderful guy. And, and from my understanding is that you two won the mixed doubles. I could play on the 60s 
so there was no problem. CIU was in NCAA, okay, but they were not in the division. They were independent. So it was okay. It was okay. And, 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 so yes, yes, we just have to go ahead and see how we do it. That came up. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and some of my teammates are still going strong. Yeah. 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 Well, well, some of you know Winnie Lim. Yeah. 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 Well, Winnie, Winnie, yeah. 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 and I were proud yeah. 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 on the team. But, but yes, yes, I had, I had some, some extraordinary uh, happenings. The first year, we played Oregon State at Broadway. And there was a baseball game going on at the same time. And, and I beat Dean Carter, Carter, who was, was a ranked player in the Pacific Northwest Men. And when he got back, and they, they had the, um, I probably like, like the Monday sports review at the school, and, and with the reporters, they, they all, well, they, they all were saying, how could you, you know, how could you lose to a girl? I mean, that was just unbelievable to them. And, and so, so the athletic director wrote CLU, and, 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 and not, not only that, that this guy then wrote, wrote this article for the Oregon, which I actually still have that article. And, and he, he said, said that the baseball, baseball team, team, the balls, the balls, were, balls were coming over, foul balls, balls were coming over, and, and people, people were rooting against him, him and, and he had yeah, this whole big story, they wrote this whole big story, which most of it wasn't true. Well, when we got a hold of that, the English professor, Father Harrison, he wrote back to the, the newspaper back there. And he said, said I was at that match. match. I, I sat there and watched that. that. And, you know, you're, you're doing a disservice to Janet because I watched, watched the whole match, match and she beat him fair and square. And he was at So the result of that, though, was that Oregon State said that they never play Seattle again with me on the team. So we were home and home. So then the next year we go down to Oregon State, and so, so I wasn't was going to play. And, and then Norman Earl was, do you remember Norman? Do you remember the name Norman Earl? Uh, he, he was, was also a ranking player in the Pacific Northwest. He wanted to play. So, so he came to me and he said, well, I said, sure, but I thought he was just going to play. Yeah, I'll go off something like that. And he, and he said, no, I want it. And the, the coach kind of threw up his hand and said, you went to the athletic director. He said, I don't want to play that. So, so we were kind of behind, behind the all of the other batches were going. going. And, and it ended up that his whole fraternity lined the pole. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't get it. But you know, when you think about it though, these were guys here in the Pacific Northwest that probably were, you know, okay in the Northwest, but they, they certainly didn't have the background that I had from Mr. Stowe, the tactics, the strategy, you know, all of that. That they probably did. And they probably didn't think they could all play serve the Holly as good as they were throughout all of that. So I think this is a surprise. Then everybody wanted to then they all wanted to play. And then it just came became a big thing. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I beat Alfie against him. This was another incredible thing. Uh, because Bill Collian from here, um, the second year that I was playing here, and I had Seattle who had sent me to the, the first all colleges, which was the, the tournament before they made the NCAA hadn't qualified it yet as a championship. So it was in St. Louis, I won that, came home, was just playing the circuit here, and, and again winning everything, and so they decided to send me east. Well, Bill and I played, played mixed doubles, I think we won the mixed doubles, it was uh, Washington State, and I won, I won the single doubles and mix, and we got on a plane, plane at 10.30 at night, flew to Chicago, Chicago changed, changed planes, got, got into, into Philadelphia about 1 o'clock, the next, next day, day and I, I had to play, play I had, had, had the women had to play two rounds that day. So, so I had them on the easily, 
because they were saying there was a pro circuit and there, you know, uh, but there were really no women playing on it. But he was taking the cream of the crop all of the time. So I think, and see right after that is when he took, you know, Rod Laver and he had that whole group. So it kind of got in rocky water there for several years until 68. And then finally it got. And I'll give you another little note on that is Where's Steven? So 70 is when we had the first uh, tournament with, with Arthur Ashe at, at UW. Yeah. Okay, so I get a call from Larry Munger on Friday morning. This is the tournament is, no, it was just an exhibition, wasn't it? Saturday, it was a, like a four-player. Yeah, four player. Yeah, it was a four-player yeah. thing. 
And so Larry Munger calls me and he says, you know, at the same time, Billy Jean King is here for a pro promotion with Head. And he said, so you want to play an exhibition with her? And I said, when? And he says, tonight at the <laughs> And I said, what? So anyway, we did. We played this exhibition and Bob Cram was was kind of, you know, kind of, and, and actually people started saying, why don't you play? Because we were just rallying. And I just always remember Arthur Ashe kidding me and saying, well, why didn't you guys start playing? We could have waited for you. <laughs> but it ended up that Billy Jean and, and Larry King were here, and we came back on Sunday morning, and I played Billy Jean, and Bill played Larry King here at the tennis club. <laughs> And Billie Jean had just launched her big thing. This was 70. And had just went, and she, we split sets when we were playing. And she said, why don't you come? And I just remember saying to her, I have six kids. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny was like four months old. Yeah. I said, you know, get real. <laughs> yeah. So that's another, yeah, I mean. I could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. Leave them for the book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. for the book. <laughs> well, again, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure having you here. It's certainly a pleasure having you again as part of our organization for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Coming up. Okay. That's cool. So people don't ask us a ton of questions. Number one question is where is such and such? Or where is so and so? Oh, there we go. Yeah.